welcome to everyone who has joined the webinar this morning. My name is Arifa Esop, and I am a business development manager for in based in Johannesburg. Today, we're talking about estate planning in an offshore world. And what are some of the more pertinent aspects to consider when investing your clients offshore? We get asked this a lot in our world, and so we thought it apt to unpack this in more detail. With me is our guest, Tim Mertens, who is the chairperson of Sovereign Trust SA Limited and an expert in cross-border tax planning and changes in legislation. Tim often appears on radio and television to chat about these topics. A little interesting fact about Tim, he tells me he loves classic cars and has built up a small collection himself. He only collects past British classic cars of a bygone era when they were really well crafted. Tim also wanted me to let you know he is not related to the Durban born All Blacks rugby, rugby player number 10, Andrew Mertens. Andrew has an H in his name and apparently he kicks far better than Tim. Sovereign is one of the largest independent corporate and trust providers and manages over 20,000 structures across the world. So the format we'll be following today is I'll be having a conversation with Tim and addressing some of the more popular questions wealth managers ask. We'll chat for about 40, 45 minutes and then we'll take questions from you in the last few minutes of the session. Just so there are no surprises, there will also be a quick survey that will pop up on your screen towards the end of the session, which will help us understand your needs better. But don't worry too much about that. I'll remind you about that later. Before we proceed, just some usual housekeeping, which we've all become accustomed to by now. We're going to cover a lot of ground today. So this session is being recorded and the recording will be made available after the webinar. We have put together a download that covers this topic. We'll be putting the link in the chat towards the end of the webinar, but it will also be included in the thank you mailer that we send out to you later on. It's important to note the information and scenarios discussed in this webinar are generic in nature and should not be construed as tax or legal advice. Clients should always take advice based on their personal circumstances prior to making any changes to their tax or legal arrangements. CPD points will automatically be awarded if you attend this full live session. There is one CPD point available for this session if you listen to the recording at a later stage or you drop off in the middle, you'll still have the opportunity of earning CPD points as long as you answer the assessment afterwards. We always love hearing from you. So please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I also want to point out that some of the products available on Innate Offshore may not be available to certain advisors, depending on the license held. The best thing for you to do would be to consult with your compliance officer or key individual, just to make sure. Welcome, Tim, and thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here, Rifa, and uh... Thank you to Innate for the opportunity and welcome to everybody who's joined us. Thank you. We're talking about something gloomy today, estate planning considerations when investing offshore. Yet there are many out there who are not sure what the implications of pro probate are on their offshore investments. In a very simple way, how would you explain what is meant by probate? Good. Thank you. Well, I think to firstly position this, um, you know, people nowadays are very global, as we all know. People are uh, in moving, moving countries. They've got assets in different places around the world. And I think it's very important, therefore, to consider not only tax, but estate duty implications relating to those particular assets um, when people do this. And one of the issues that crops up, obviously, is that, as you say, of probate. Uh, probate really is a British common law uh, construction. It's a term from British common law. 
United Kingdom, Guernsey, Jersey, Isle of Man, Ireland, those sorts of places have British common law, Gibraltar and there are others. And essentially the, the probate process is a formal application by an executor or somebody who wants to ultimately um, take into account and have legal authority to consider and, and deal with assets of a deceased person in another country. So uh, that is usually what we would call um, a probate process, uh, certainly in the UK and in those other British common law jurisdictions that I mentioned. And, and tell me, Tim, when is probate applicable? At what levels or at what amounts, if you want to call it that? Well, certainly probate would apply, um, obviously, if there is, for example, a UK will. So if there is a UK will, then obviously um, a probate would have to be applied for. Then um, usually it depends on the type of asset uh, and it depends on sometimes the value of the particular asset in that particular jurisdiction. So, for example, in the UK, um, assets in excess of £10,000 £10, usually would be considered for a probate process. Um, and obviously what we call situs assets, assets which uh, are actually situated and are potentially taxed in that particular jurisdiction, again, like the UK, Guernsey, Jersey, where, wherever, um, they would also form part of a, um, a process for probate. And the application really would uh, take place to the, to the probate office and uh, um, a deed would be provided, um, a grant of, of probate, shall I say, would be granted uh, to the particular executor where there is a will. And uh, if there isn't a will, there sometimes isn't a will, then there would be letters of administration that would be granted to that executor under, again, under the probate process. And Tim, what, what is the equivalent of a grant of probate in South Africa? What would we do typically in South Africa? Well, here um, we do take um, a lot of our um, persuasion and, and, and laws over, over time from English law. I mean, obviously we have a Roman Dutch system of law here, but we have borrowed, if you like, uh, certain elements of, of, of law from other countries and from British common law in particular. So here it is a similar process in that um, a, an estate would be lodged with the master of the high court in the particular jurisdiction where the deceased person was living at the time of his or her death. And there are various master of the high court officers around the country. It would be lodged, the estate would be lodged, uh, you know, obviously the, the original will and a whole lot of other documents and inventory of all the assets, etc. And then on consideration, the master of the high court would issue letters of executorship. So um, those, that would be essentially the legal um, uh, the legal authority that the master of the high court would give to an executor that the executor would then use to approach banks, other institutions to obtain what we call certificates of balance as to exactly what those assets comprise as at the date of the deceased's death. So similar process, um, usually estates in excess of uh, 125,000 rand would uh, would have would 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 be uh, estates whereby a less of executorship would be issued, and below that there is a, a provision of the Administration of Estates Act under Section 18.3, which would say that uh, there's no real sort of formal process. Well, it's less formal, shall I say? And an 18.3 estate would be those assets, obviously under 125,000, um, and more of a, a basic administration process, not a more formal process. Uh, as when um, letters of executorship are issued. So, so what I'm hearing you say is probate are actual documents issued or grant of probate is actual documents issued by the authorities in the UK, which many of us would be familiar with as letters of executorship in a South African context. And it's generally applicable when it's an asset value is uh, just around 10,000 great British pounds. Correct? Yes, um, but um, you know, it, and also if there are if there are assets that are uh, deemed to be uh, you know in the UK, so for example, property, immovable property is always a an interesting one where probate is always always going to apply uh, in immovable property. Private international law will dictate a, a situation like that, with or without a will. And it will dictate that because the asset, the, the immovable property is in the UK, then British law will apply or English law will apply. So in that case, yes, it's an automatic probate process. Um, but sometimes 
you can avoid probates. Very often you can. So, for example, where an asset um, is bequeathed Mom, to a wife and spouse. Tim, I want to stop you there. We're going to come that in a moment uh, and we'll definitely talk about how uh, ways to avoid probate but I'd like to move on to the issue of wills um, and how exactly that works when it comes to these offshore assets. Do I need more than one will, um, a South African will as well as a foreign will? Well, you definitely need a South African will. So everybody watching um, should have a, a valid and up-to-date will. And that is really, really important. I think very often, you know, we're chasing um, reductions in taxation during our lifetime, but we, don't, we sometimes take the eye, our eyes off the ball in relation to the potential estate duty issues that may trigger. And that obviously is where a will comes in. So you want freedom of testation and you should obviously have a South African will. In relation to foreign assets, it really depends on the circumstances. It depends on the nature of the asset. It depends on the value of the asset. And it also depends on the location of the asset. So, for example, in, in the UK, um, again, you might be able to avoid having a second will um, if, the, if the assets are, for example, in a bank account and they, and they, and they, they perhaps under uh, an amount of threshold of 50,000 uh, 50, pounds. Different, uh, where, where bank accounts are concerned, um, institutions, uh, asset holders, as we call them, have different thresholds. So some banks will say, well, up to 50,000 pounds, you don't need, uh, you wouldn't need a will, they will just deal with it. Um, others have lower thresholds. It really depends on the institution. But certainly where immovable property is concerned, you would want a will um, so that you want the certainty that that creates uh, in, in relation to that particular asset. And certain investments, also you may be, may be able to avoid not having a, another will, and it depends on the investments, and it depends on how they are structured. And what investments would that be, Tim? Well, typically, if, um, you know, what is popular nowadays are uh, wrappers or uh, endowment-type products, um, investments which are either uh, in those sorts of structures or in retirement trusts are very popular structures now to hold uh, investments for the long term. So they would obviously fall within their own ambit and there wouldn't be a will that would be required to deal with them. And sometimes also assets which are registered uh, not, in that, not in the particular jurisdiction where the uh, investment is made, but in another center. So for example, the innate uh, platform as an example in, in Jersey. So it may, it may be that that platform invests into the UK. It doesn't necessarily mean now that you need a UK will. So it really, as I say, depends on the circumstances. Um, and I think always one should get proper advice as to uh, what steps to take when you're dealing with a foreign asset, whether you should have a will or not. And just as a matter of interest for our audience, how difficult is it to set up a will? And the reason I'm asking is that that is that um, Innate has has partnered with with solicitors in Jersey to assist with that process, and they've made it quite easy. But in your experience, how difficult is it? I mean, it's it's not it's not a difficult process at all. I think if you have property in a particular jurisdiction. Um, then what you should do is seek out advice in that particular jurisdiction. So, for example, in your situation with, uh, with Jersey, if you've got a solicitor lined up, that's great, because then what you're doing is you're creating certainty around that particular asset. You know that there's a process that's going to be followed. Where the problems come in is where you have an asset in a particular jurisdiction. Um, you haven't found out exactly what laws are going to be applicable in that particular jurisdiction. And your will, and I know we'll probably, you'll probably ask me that a bit later, but your will doesn't necessarily cover that asset. So um, you want to create certainty around assets that you've got in foreign jurisdictions. And um, you want to obviously check it out, especially where movable property is concerned. You would want to do that as, as a matter of course. Um, but it wouldn't be a bad idea just to check, obviously, with a service provider where investments are concerned as to how those assets might be dealt with in the estate. And if there's uncertainty, then to get the advice in that particular jurisdiction. Because, again, 
you want certainty. You don't want uncertainty when it comes to an asset. Um, the deceased person is gone, and then and then you know there's there's very often a, an issue with uh, conflict of laws and 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 delays and costs. And, and Tim, I know you said that it's extremely important to have a will, especially if you have offshore assets. But what if I am in a situation where I don't have a will? Then what? Um, for any planner, that's uh, one word: disaster. Um, because you know, then what happens is that your freedom of testation, which is a very important right that we all have, to actually sit down and uh, consider how we would like our assets to devolve in the event of our death. It's in a very, very important right that we have. If you don't do that, then essentially legislation, as I'm sure many of us on this, on this uh, webinar know, uh, legislation takes over in the form of the Intestate Succession Act here in South Africa. And that means that there's then a prescribed process that takes place uh, in terms of how that estate is going to be devolved. And your, your freedom of testation is then taken away. There can be very particular problems in relation to an intestate succession um, where there are minors because minors then um, will not receive the benefit that they otherwise would have received immediately until they aid, uh, attain the age of majority. And then it's the Guardian's Fund, which is a, a construction of the, the March of the High Court that would then oversee that. So, you know, a dying intestate is, is really not a good thing. And, and even if it's a basic will, everybody should have a will. Mm, that makes sense. Now, Tim, assume we have a will in South Africa and we have a will in a foreign location, okay? How important is it for both your wills to talk to each other? Do you need to ring fence your South African assets? And uh, in each world, so your South African assets in your South African will and your offshore assets in your offshore will. Yeah, yeah you, that, that's exactly right. You would want to do that. Um, and when you say that, yes, both, both wills, so that whoever is drafting the will in the foreign jurisdiction should have sight of your South African will and vice versa, so that there is no particular conflict. There may be particular issues that... Uh, of law which take place in another jurisdiction which then negate something in the jurisdiction where the, uh, where the deceased person resides. And also there are sometimes issues which crop up on, on the issue of revocation. So for example, as you probably know, in a will you normally say uh, right up front in the preamble that I revoke all previous wills and dispositions made by myself. Now, you know, that may inadvertently um, revoke a will offshore if, if it's not very clear that the, the, the South African will, uh, which is revoking other wills, is only in relation to South African assets and vice versa in the offshore world. So you can have conflicts which, uh, you know, admittedly they are rare, but it does mean that the people involved in, in drafting a, a both wills should talk to each other and there should be you know, coordination between them to make sure that the proper result is achieved in the event of the, uh, the testator's uh, death. So just to sum up what I'm hearing, uh, Tim, is that depending on the asset held, it does make sense to have separate wills, a local will uh, and a South African will, I mean, a South African will and a foreign will. Your assets are dealt with in a, in a ring fence manner, and it's an absolute no-no not to have a will because like you said, that spells disaster and you don't want to be in a, in a situation where it's dealt with according to interstate succession and you no longer have the freedom to decide who gets what. And most importantly, if you do have two worlds, it's absolutely critical that they speak the same language and that they're used as a reference point for each of those worlds. Yeah. And just to make the point again that, um, you know, a, a second will is not going to be appropriate in every si single circumstance, but mm -hmm. in certain circumstances, it is quite critical that you do have a second will. So again, it's a matter of getting the proper advice around it. Tim, what would you say are some of the advantages of having a second will or foreign will, especially when you've reached this point now where your assets need to be dealt with? What and, and, and as timelessly as possible, what would you say are the advantages? Well, 
um, you've mentioned the one, and that is to have your estate uh, managed in a, in a timeless fashion. So if you don't have a will, you know, in a foreign country, then there may be delays because then the, the executor or whoever's going to be dealing with the, with the foreign asset is going to have to wait for copies of the will, um, which we call a, a sort of a resealing scenario. So they're going to have to be proper copies that are issued by the master of the high court here. There can be delays uh, if you don't have a second will. If you have a second will, so for example, you mentioned in, in Jersey, um, you deal with solicitors. Well then, if there is a will there or in any other jurisdiction, then they can start to actually wind up the state immediately. And that's a major advantage because sometimes letters of executorship, you know, can take, you know, three, six or even longer months here, depending on the master's office and depending on circumstances here. So you don't want to delay in setting up a, um, uh, in, in, in the administration of the estate. Um, and that's, that's one thing. The second thing is that you do want certainty around the law that's going to be applicable in the jurisdiction where the asset resides. So it's okay in places like perhaps British common law jurisdictions where, for example, in the UK, very often a South African will will be accepted. Um, and, you know, they, they usually wouldn't be an issue. But in Europe, that might be completely different. Um, Europe doesn't have a, a common law. It has civil law. And on that basis, um, there are different types of laws which apply in the administration of estates, what we call forced airship. And that simply means that you don't have the freedom of gestation that I was talking about earlier, that in, in certain circumstances, you have to actually, your will has to devolve according to a set uh, process. Now, if that's going to take place uh, in, a, in a foreign country, then you need to make sure that there's certainty around how that law is going to apply. So it, it's, it's things like that. Um, also, in, in other jurisdictions, there may be um, a requirement that the, the will has to be translated into the language where the, where the asset is uh, situated. And, you know, they're just issues around that which can make, uh, make administration a bit more difficult. I, I just will one, just almost just point out one issue which is quite important, uh, and that is that there is a recent, a fairly recent 2017, I think, um, EU succession regulation which has come out, which really is, is simplified things in a lot of ways. Um, it doesn't solve all the problems, but it does simplify things from the point of view that you can elect now to apply your particular law uh, in, a, in an EU country. So if I've got a South African will and I've got an asset in Europe, or let's assume in France or somewhere like that, I can elect under EU succession regulations to apply South African law. There is a process that takes place. And again, you've got to get the proper advice. But it is assisting people who have uh, um, estates in, you know, cross border in various different jurisdictions. Okay, great. If you've just joined us, we are talking to Tim Mertens on some important aspects you should be considering when investing your clients offshore. Just a reminder, the session is being recorded and the recording will be made available after the webinar along with some supporting material which will help explain some of the issues we are talking about today. CPD points will automatically be awarded if you're attending this full session. If you drop off in the middle or you watch the recording later, you'll still have the opportunity of earning those CPD points. As long as you answer the assessment, we'll send you in the thank you mailer. Please remember to continue to put your questions on the Q&A for Tim and we'll get to them shortly. Now, Tim, I'd like to move on a bit to uh, estate duty and executor's fees and how that is dealt with. How would one um, work out the estate duty or how is estate duty calculated in the South African context? Well, um, again, this is prescribed by, by legislation and um, essentially what it would, would entail is that all assets in the name of the, the, the deceased person at the time of, of death uh, are taken into account, um, are brought into the estate, and um, also assets which are deemed to be part of 
the estate of the of, of the deceased person. So those can include assets which may not be under the under the deceased person's control prior to their death, but are, for example, with a with an assurer or with um, you know an institution, and they would be brought into the estate under deeming provisions. Um, then um, once that is done. There are uh, certain deductions which are made. So for funeral, funeral expenses and other expenses um, that, are, that are calculated and are deducted from, from the, uh, the uh, deemed property and property in the estate. And then um, essentially there is a net estate, a figure of a net estate. From that is deducted a, an abatement, what we call an abatement under section 4A. Uh, and that is currently, as many of us know, uh, three and a half million rand. So that comes off. And then after the abatement, you get to what is referred to as the dutable estate. And the dutable estate then is the amount for which uh, estate duty is calculated. And it's 20% of the dutable estate will be the duty. Now, obviously, there are exceptions along the way, as I mentioned. So, for mm -hmm. example, there are interspousal concessions, as we all know, if you leave assets to a surviving spouse, uh, as in the UK, same here, um, those won't be taken into account. But um, yeah, essentially that, that, is, that is the process uh, that is followed. And an estate duty return is completed by the executive uh, uh, of the estate. And obviously, South African Revenue Service are involved in, in the assessment of that return. And uh, in some cases, there may not be duty. In, in some cases, there may be a lot of duty. It really depends, again, on the circumstances. And, and Tim, will I need two executors because I've got an asset that's offshore now. I mean, if you've got a if you've got a foreign will, um, well, you're certainly going to have to have an executor uh, here in South Africa if you've got a South African will, uh, and it's over 125,000 rand. Uh, offshore again, it depends on the asset. So if you, um, for example, you know there is a there is a principle in in the UK, um, the principle of survivorship. So if you've got an asset which is jointly owned between you and your spouse, then there is no probate issue. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no requirement for any will and therefore no requirement for any executor. So it just simply seeming, seamlessly passes uh, onto that survivor. So it really is going to depend again on the asset offshore. And um, yes, if there's a will, then there will be a foreign executor. So, so how will the executor's fees be dealt with depending on the investment held? Do I need to pay both executors? Yes. Um, so if there are two wills, then executor's fees are going, to, are going to trigger in both jurisdictions. So here it would be 3.5% plus VAT on the uh, gross amount of the estate. And in other jurisdictions like the UK, Guernsey, Jersey, Alamein, other British common law jurisdictions, it really depends. They work sometimes on um, time charges, a percentage of the estate, uh, on professional fees, their various arrangements. Um, but obviously, executive's fees are, are uh, uh, you know, are a, 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 I suppose, a process which is a normal process when a professional executive is going to wind up an estate. But um, as we know, there are certain certain executive's fees which are excluded, or, or there are certain assets, shall I say, which are excluded from executive's fees. So, for example, those assets in trust, obviously, because that's not part of the estate in any event. If there's a, um, a wrapper or some sort of a ret a retirement vehicle or some sort of vehicle where there's um, a contractual relationship where the asset passes from one, one uh, the deceased uh, estate to the surviving spouse, usually there wouldn't be an executive's fee uh, implication there, only in a state duty one potentially. So, Tim, I'd like to come back to trusts uh, a little later, but do the two executives actually need to communicate with each other, am I right? Yeah, they, usually they would, yes. Okay, so you're saying that no matter what, where the asset is held or uh, what the actual asset is, you cannot escape estate duty in South Africa if you are tax resident in South Africa. Yeah, because we work on a, on a worldwide system of tax, as you know, so that includes estate duty as well. So it's not only tax, but it's, it's also assets in your estate. So um, unless those assets are specifically excluded from your South African estate, uh, and that can be done in various ways, uh, 
um, they will be uh, they will form part of the calculation of of either property or deemed property in the estate of the deceased person. And uh, yes, and then estate duty potentially applies. Again, I say potentially because if you're leaving it's all your assets right. to a survivor, then there wouldn't be. But usually it would be, it would be taken into account for estate duty. So Tim, what about capital gains tax on death? What happens with that? Well, so like, like uh, it's not a separate tax, but capital gains tax would apply in the estate. Um, so it's a, it's a disposal um, of an asset it's, um, or a deemed disposal of an asset. There's an asset which now has to be considered in a different way. And that's in relation to how uh, the testator or testatrix has uh, drafted the will. But that asset in any event is no longer the deceased. It's now part of the estate. And as such, capital gains tax will have to be considered uh, in, the, in the administration of the estate. So that's unfortunately a tax which can't be avoided. So CGD is not a separate calculation. It forms part of the estate duty calculation. And depending on whether or not it, the executor touches that asset, executor's fees may or may not apply. Is that that would yeah, executive fees normally would apply to the asset, but again, it depends on the asset. Um, but uh, certainly capital gains tax does have to be taken into account. Again, it really, as I say, depends on the asset. So, um, you know, uh, there are certain assets where, for example, uh, you know, there wouldn't, be, there wouldn't be a capital gains tax implication because capital gains tax would be considered within the product itself with particular types of, uh, of products, endowment products, for example. And obviously capital gains tax wouldn't apply with a retirement trust type scenario. But in all other cases, capital gains tax would be a consideration. So we know that executor's fees is at three and a half percent expat and is extremely negotiable here in South Africa. Well, not extremely, but I suppose negotiable and something that you do upfront. What what do offshore executors generally charge if they have to deal with an offshore asset? Yeah, there are there are statutory um, guidelines about uh, executor's fees. Um, in places like the UK. And as I said earlier, it's, it's essentially um, sometimes a percentage of the asset, uh, but more often than not, not it's, a, it's a professional fee that is, that is, that is um, generated for the, for the administration of the estate. Very often it's time charge based depending on, depending on the complexity of the estate. So typically solicitors will, will charge, my experience has been that they will, they will time charge for for what is, in, what is involved in, in that particular estate and, and charge accordingly. Now, Tim, we have a scenario, uh, just generic, where we've got two account holders on an investment. Uh, would that be different for uh, the estate duty calculation? Well, the, the asset would, if the asset was going to pass to the survivor, the, um, the deceased's portion would be taken into account for state duty purposes um, in South Africa, because it is, it is again deemed, uh, deemed to be a, an asset of the estate uh, of the deceased person. But that wouldn't necessarily mean that it would have to be caught up in, in the estate itself. In mm. other words, it wouldn't be part of the administration of the estate and it wouldn't attract executor's fees but it would be taken into account for statutory purposes. So would that answer be different depending on the marital regime of the client? So let's assume um, a community of property? Uh, well, if it's, if it's uh, in, in community of property, then obviously the half share would uh, form part of the deceased person's yes, estate, yes. absolutely. The remaining share obviously is not part of the estate at all. Uh, if it's completely out of community pro of property and there's a, and there's a, but it's a joint asset, then sometimes that is an issue. And we sometimes recommend that there is a, a deed of gift, which is granted by one spouse to the other so that you don't have issues with the, with the state, you know, estate issues down the line, especially when it's an out of community of uh, property situation. Um, so, um, Again, it depends on the, on the particular asset and it depends on the circumstances. But yes, marital regime would be considered. 
Okay. Um, Tim, thank you for that. I want to move on a bit to CITES. In, in our world, many, many wealth managers often ask us about CITES, and I think it will really help clear up some misconceptions. Um, very simply, what does CITES tax refer to? What does it mean? It simply means location. Um, location of where the asset uh, resides. So uh, a UK CITES asset would be a UK asset. So for example, immovable property, for example. Um, and the same in other jurisdictions around the world. And if there is a UK CITES asset or a US CITES asset, then it simply means that um, that might be subject to estate taxes in the US. If it was a US uh, uh, asset, or if it was a UK CITES asset, then it would mean that inheritance tax, IHT as we call it, would be applicable. So CITES tax is referred to um, the tax which would be applicable in relation to the asset which resides or is situated in the particular jurisdiction where that tax applies. So a CITES covers things like US estate tax and UK inheritance tax. So it will fall under that broad heading. Am I correct? So Tim, correct. should I be yeah. concerned about US estate tax or UK inheritance tax, inheritance tax if I'm invested in a unit trust or an endowment or a retirement trust for that matter? In those sorts of structures, you know, usually there is planning that goes on where you can avoid a CITES tax applying. And the reason for that is that the fund uh, or the entity in which you're invested is not registered uh, in the UK or the US or, or in the, or in Europe or wherever it happens to be. It may be, in, it, it might invest there, but the ownership is actually with, a, with an entity um, or a product which is, which is actually licensed and registered in another jurisdiction, typically Guernsey, Jersey, Isle of Man, places like that. And on that basis, CITES tax wouldn't apply. It's only where, for example, uh, ex, um, their investment allowance, perhaps as an example, they go and they, and we've seen this happen before, they go and invest themselves into the stock market or into some fund or into something overseas and um, they own that asset themselves, then when they die, CITES tax is going to trigger in that particular jurisdiction. And that is very problematic in, in many respects because it simply means that you're now subject to potential inheritance tax or estate tax or whatever the tax happens to be in that particular jurisdiction. Where with just proper planning, you can actually avoid that in large part. Immovable property, no, but certainly with investments you can. So it's really a lesson I think to a lot of people here is that they should get the proper advice as to how the structure is going to look when they do uh, utilize their investment allowance or they want to invest offshore. If you're doing it directly, be careful because it may well be that you might be subject to an alternate uh, form of tax which could otherwise be avoided. And, and Tim, what sort of rates are we looking at when we're talking about UK inheritance, inheritance tax or US estate tax? Um, they're quite penal in the sense that the UK um, has what has called what we uh, what we refer to as a null rate band, and the null rate band is from zero to three hundred and twenty-five thousand pounds. So anything in that range uh, is, not, is not dutable in the UK, but anything above that, then uh, a, a rate of 40% kicks in, and that's pretty high. It's, it was actually a lot higher in previous years, as much as 55%, but it's, it's 40 now. And that's still pretty high because, you know, you, you, might, have, yeah, Sorry. You, you might have a very sizable estate in the UK and anything, you know, potentially, if it's not going to a surviving spouse, anything over uh, 325,000 pounds will, will attract 40%. In the US, it can actually be even worse because their thresholds are very low, uh, usually around $60,000. Uh, 
and everything over and above that, the CITES tax would be 40%. So big difference. Um, I might just add that, um, you know, if you are paying CITES tax in, a, in another jurisdiction, then um, sometimes you can get the benefit of double taxation uh, agreements, which South Africa has. Now, just to, um, you know, I suppose drill down on this a little bit, is that obviously jurisdictions like South Africa and lots of others have double taxation treaties. And we've got numerous treaties with numerous countries, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have estate planning uh, treaty or, or treaties which cover estate planning uh, issues. And in fact, I can tell you now that we have very, very few. We only have about five or six in South Africa. We have two major ones, one with the UK and one with the US, and they go back quite a long way. And then we've got regional ones. But, you know, you've got to be very careful because if you've got an asset, for example, in Europe, where there aren't any uh, estate duty um, treaties with South Africa, then if you're going to be paying tax in that particular jurisdiction, then essentially you're not going to get it. You're not going to get a deduction back in South Africa and you're going to be paying double tax. So you've got to be very, very careful about, about CITES tax. And, uh, and obviously, you know, if you are going to be using a treaty, make sure that it's an asset with a treaty country. Yes. So, so uh, just to be clear, what you're saying is that CITES is only applicable if you hold the asset directly in your name. For example, Tim, you're invested in Google shares and you hold those assets in your name, Tim Mertens. And if you held those through a trust structure or unit trust or a wrapper, CITES would not apply. That's right. Yeah. Generally speaking, that's correct. Great stuff. Now, Tim, I'd like to chat a little bit about this because you've alluded to it, and I want to go into a little bit more detail just for the benefit of our audience. Why, what would you say are some of the advantages of using a retirement trust structure versus, for example, a wrapper? Well, they're both, they're both good structures. Um, you know, I'm sure everybody on the, on, on the, in this webinar uh, is familiar with uh, um, endowments, and those are simply investments which are made um, for, you know, a period of time. Usually, uh, there's a period of time of five years or so, um, or maybe longer, but um, done through a South African institution and perhaps using an offshore center to, to invest in, in, in various parts of the world. They're very well known, they're very well understood, and they do have a lot of benefits uh, within them. The, the main one, of course, being that uh, portfolio tax is paid uh, under the full yeah. fund approach um, along the way, um, and that there are reductions of, uh, of certain things like uh, capital gains tax, which otherwise might be 18 or so percent. It, you can get it down, I think, to 12 or, so, or something like that. So there are uh, advantages, there are no, there's no executor's fees, um, but there is estate duty in relation, to, in, to, in relation to the investment. So that has to be considered. Um, but of course, there wouldn't be CITES tax and there wouldn't be any issue of, of probate in the particular jurisdiction where the investments are made. So those are all very, very good advantages. Um, then there is the trust type scenario. Um, we're talking here about what is referred to as a 40 E structure, a 40 E Guernsey structure, 40 E being the income tax provision in Guernsey, which exempts tax in Guernsey where these types of trust structures are set up. We are not talking in a scenario like this about an intervivus trust where we just set up an offshore trust for the family. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a retirement, bespoke retirement trust um, for retirement purposes. Again, lots of benefits in that. Um, might even have the edge, and of course I'm, I'm in the trust business, so I suppose I would say that, but it might even have the edge over the endowment simply because um, of course there wouldn't be uh, estate duty necessarily on, on, the, on the amounts uh, within that trust. If uh, there are changes in legislation which may occur in, in South Africa down the line, based on the Davis Tax Reform Committee recommendations, um, it may be that contributions to this uh, type of structure uh, 
could fall part of the estate. We don't think they do at the moment. But if they did, then in any event, the growth uh, that was um, uh, rolled up within the particular trust structure wouldn't be part of uh, a South African deceased estate or a member's estate. There wouldn't be executor's fees, um, which is obviously good, and there wouldn't be tax along the way because Section 40 E of the uh, Guernsey uh, tax law essentially would exempt tax along the way. So whereas you're paying uh, portfolio tax in the, in the um, endowment, you wouldn't be paying that in, in the uh, 40 E structure. So there are, you know, there are advantages. I think they're both good products. They're both good ways of considering estate planning. Um, but, you know, it really, again, depends on personal circumstances and what people want to achieve uh, when they're investing offshore. So, Tim, what I'm hearing you say is that there are various things for a client to be uh, invested offshore, and we should not use a, a, a blanket approach. And depending on the client's needs and objectives and financial goals, there is a place for every product, and it makes sense as a wealth manager to explore all these options. And, and thank you for that, Tim. I think what we should do now is let's just go and take some questions from the audience. Um, let me just find this, if you give me. Okay, so here's a great question that's come through from the audience. So, and this is on probate, um, Tim. What happens in the case of a joint account with the spouse or kids with the South African will be accepted, uh, recognized for that? Yeah, that, that is, a, that is a, good, a, a good question because, um, well, generally speaking, South African wills will be accepted and considered in the UK. Uh, I think um, there, there shouldn't be any particular issues with that. So if, if you have one will, and that is a, is a worldwide will in relation to all of your assets, then that would usually be accepted in, in places like the UK. Europe, states, other places like that, maybe not. Um, but if it's a joint, um, if it's a joint, uh, they're joint holders on, a, on an investment, um, then the UK principle of um, survivorship would apply. In other words, that it you wouldn't need a probate situation um, because that asset would just seamlessly pass to the survivor and you wouldn't need any probate uh, and there wouldn't be any, any particular issues with uh, CITES tax uh, either. So in that situation, yes, one will would, would suffice and, uh, and that would probably be fine. Okay, so this, I think that answers this question directly. Is an offshore will still required if the only offshore asset you have is an innate investment and it is a joint innate investment account? Because in that situation, what would happen is it would just pass over to the second holder for continuity purposes. So an uh, offshore will is not required in that case. Yeah, I mean, it, again, it really very much depends on the institution where the asset holder, so another, I suppose, innate in, in, in Jersey for, for your purposes. Um, but sometimes it is up to the institution, uh, the asset holder, the bank, the investment house, as to whether or not they feel there should be a, uh, an approach for probate and that, that clearance needs to be given on that particular asset. And so I suppose that is why you've set up and, and others have set up relationships with uh, local solicitors just to, to, to be to make that process sure that the law that's going to apply and the proper administration of the of the estate um mm -hmm. but yeah you wouldn't necessarily have to have a second will for that thank you tim another question from the audience when a holder passes away or when an investor passes away, do those funds need to be repatriated to South Africa? Um, in general terms, no. Um, what would happen though is that it is very prudent and I'm not an exchange control expert, but um, it's very prudent to make sure that you are compliant with South African Reserve Bank regulations. And I think it's six and seven or five and six uh, those, those sorts of regulations um, require that if you 
acquire an, uh, if you acquire an asset offshore as a South African resident, that you actually should get clearance to keep that asset offshore from the Reserve Bank. And you can do that usually through your, you know, your local Reserve Bank agent, any bank. But I think it is prudent to do that because the Reserve Bank does need to understand and know that there is a foreign asset which you hold as a South African resident. So that would be the prudent thing to do is to make sure that your, uh, you know, the, um, the Reserve Bank agent concerned that you deal with in South Africa is notified and that that approval is given. And on, under those circumstances, no, you wouldn't have to uh, repatriate the, the asset. And, and that wouldn't apply if there is a second holder, am I right? Because you would have already applied for Reserve Bank clearance at the outset. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if both holders have applied for Reserve Bank clearance, then, they, then their clearance is there. And then they, they wouldn't, under those circumstances, um, require a further clearance. Okay. You know, if, if, you, if you left the asset, for example, to a child um, who wasn't a, um, you know, or, 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 or a significant other person who wasn't a holder, then it would be very important, I think, to make sure that that situation is regularised with the Reserve Bank uh, uh, approval. And the time frame for that would generally be about 30 days? Yeah, something, something around 30 days. Okay. Here's another question, Tim. If I die interstate in SA and UK, and I have property in the UK, what will happen to the property in the UK if no one knows of the property in the UK? These are always tricky, tricky issues. Um, you're saying, sorry, the, so the question was that there's no will. There's no will. I've died interstate. I don't have a South African will, nor do I have a, a foreign will or UK will. What will happen to the property in the UK? Because chances are nobody knows about it. Yeah, that's a very good question. Well, um, you know, the property has to be dealt with. So first and foremost, you know, you would die, the deceased person would die in test states in terms of South African law. Mm -hmm. um, because they presumably died here in South Africa, then the laws of South Africa would then apply, um, the intestate succession laws would then apply, um, I suppose they would be given preference over other laws. But the point is that if there's a, if there's a, a, a UK asset, then um, obviously there would have to be a probate situation. You would be dying in intestate in the UK as well. If you didn't know about it, well, you know, um, I, I suppose that, that's a major issue because obviously then that, it has, that asset has to be dealt with in the UK. The land registry has to change, the, 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 you know, the owner has to change at some point. But uh, that would be a problematic situation because then obviously freedom of testation is gone. Uh, and then the intestate succession rules, intestacy rules would, would apply, I, I would have thought more in South Africa than in the UK. And, uh, but there would, be pro there would be tax in the UK because it would be a situs asset for sure. So big thing, have a will, get a will. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the message I think here is loud and clear. You do need to make sure that you take the time to you know, have a will. And if there's a foreign asset to make sure that potentially uh, there, is an, uh, there is a will surrounding that asset as well. But again, depending on the asset. Okay, so here's another question on inheritance tax versus estate duty. I understand that estate duty is levied on all your worldwide assets. So if you have property in the UK, that property will be subject to estate duty as well as inheritance tax. Do we not then find ourselves in a double taxation situation? Yeah, so you would in, normal, in a normal situation, yes. So first and foremost, let's just deal with a UK property. If it was under the threshold, within the nil rate band up to 325,000 pounds, then there wouldn't be uh, IHT in the UK. There would just be a probate, potential probate situation. So there wouldn't be tax. But if it was over that level and there was, let's say IHT of, you know, uh, let's say it's an asset of 500,000, uh, the nil rate band of 325, so you've got, what, 175,000 uh, asset, which would be dutable um, at 40%. So that tax would be paid. Uh, 
Um, and because the UK and South Africa have a double taxation treaty in relation to estate matters, you would then get a, you know, the benefit of that tax pay that IHT paid in the in South Africa. But of course, our rate is much lower. It's it's twenty percent. So, but you wouldn't be you wouldn't be taxed again. Put put it that way. So that's why that's why sometimes the double taxation treaty will assist um, and and will 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 obviously be a, an advantage. But. That's not the situation in, in, in many other countries where there isn't a double taxation treaty and you might well be subject to double taxation, which obviously is an issue. And that begs the question, right, you do need to plan properly and look at that asset and see whether or not you can't structure it in, a, in, a, in another way so as you can avoid those taxes. Agree. So, would an SA executor be entitled to claim executor's fees on offshore assets as these need to be reported on the SA estate from a state duty and CGT perspective, even if there's a separate offshore will? That's a good question. No, that's a very good question. Um, yes, um, because it's, it's, it's gross value in the estate. So, it's, it, it is part of the gross estate. And the fact that executor's fees are being charged. Uh, in relation to a non-resident asset doesn't mean that fees are not going to be charged in relation to the South African asset, which it is, because ultimately it's a, we work on a worldwide system of taxation. So the, the difference, of course, is where it's in some sort of uh, wrapper or structure um, where there's a contractual relationship between the deceased person prior to his or her death uh, and the institution saying that a third party beneficiary should benefit in those circumstances, there wouldn't be executive fees. But if it's just a straight asset, then executive fees would apply uh, back in South Africa. So, Tim, just a general question. What is, what is the best option for a South African with minor children when it comes to leaving offshore assets to them? Yeah, that's another good question. I think, you know, you've got to consider, again, the nature of the asset. And I think where possible, um, you know, certainly with investment assets that, that people have, uh, are, are creating overseas, there are really good ways of avoiding situs and other problems, uh, probate and other issues in a, in a, in a non-resident uh, context. Um, so where there are minor children, for example, you know, uh, there's, there's very easily a situation where you can set up, uh, you know, testamentary trusts or you can set up structures where they would benefit down the line um, and not form part of a, a whole probate uh, scenario given, given um, you, know, it, you know, where the situation is, 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 uh, is, is, is not in their name. Um, so, yeah, you know, um, I, th I think there's lots of planning opportunities that can take place where you can plan your affairs in such a way that minors can, can benefit from trusts and other structures without actually having to go through a, a, a long probate uh, process. And, and just general planning um, around that, I think, can, can sometimes avoid that. Okay, and uh, Tim, I think this is going to be one of our last questions, but I think very relevant still. If a client is only invested in unit trusts offshore on a platform do domiciled in Jersey or Guernsey, would an SA will work that covers all the client's global assets? So you've got a clause in that that says, please take into account my global assets and so no foreign will. Yeah. Yeah, that that I think that would be acceptable um, because unit trust assets are not going to form part of a, a CITES tax in a particular jurisdiction anyway. And if it's a, if it's owned on a on a platform or the ownership of that particular investment, that unit trust is uh, not um, onshore in the UK or in other jurisdictions where there might be high tax. Uh, in a in a financial services centre, for example, Guernsey, Jersey, Isle of Man, places like that then um, I think a South African will would be sufficient for, for those purposes. You wouldn't need necessarily a second will. And so you would be covering it essentially in that will and it would not be necessary. One last question, Tim. I know I said that a few seconds ago. What is the typical time charge rate? You mentioned that earlier on, but um, you didn't specify. 
that's very difficult to say because it depends on the on the firm. I mean, we um, we've just recently dealt with. It depends on the seniority of people that are dealing with the estate, uh, and it's something that um, the firm concerned, if it's solicitors, certainly would um, would need to communicate uh, up front. So you would have a discussion up front as to what what the time charges are likely to be, and usually. Um, what happens is that there's a, an engagement letter which is sent out by, if it's a, a solicitor's firm, they would send out an engagement letter and in that engagement letter would be all the, the, the fees and charges that would be uh, applicable in the administration of that particular estate. So it's, it's really a, a matter of who is doing it um, very often, who is one of the estate, who the executive is. Advisors or wealth managers, please get in touch with us and we can provide you details with the partners we have in Jersey and they can provide more information on that. So we've been through quite a lot of content today. I just want to remind you the session was recorded and the recording will be made available after the webinar along with some supporting material which will help explain all of the issues we spoke about today. Watch out for your CPD allocation that will arrive in your inbox in the next day or two. If you stayed for the entire live session this morning, there will be a quick survey at the end of the session. Please answer yes or no if you would like a follow on webinar which will cover more details of this topic. We didn't get through all of the questions and lots, Tim, but I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you, Tim, for your expert views. We really appreciate your input. Pleasure, my pleasure. And, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, thank you for interacting with us and the many questions. You've, you've been an absolutely awesome audience. Um, remember, if there's anything else you need clarity on this, on this webinar, or we didn't get to your particular question, please feel free to reach out to your business development manager in each region, and they will gladly assist. Uh, we've put up the slide of details of all of our BDMs around the country, so please do not hesitate to get in touch with us. Our next In the Room series with Stephen Backhouse is next week, Tuesday, 29th September at 9.30. Steve will be chatting to Robin Johnson from Ned Group Investments about their best of breed investment approach. Um, don't forget to register for that. Uh, you can check your emails or you can go on to www.innate.co.za. Thank you and have a great day further.